Welcome, friends and fans, to another edition of GalaxyCon Live, where we are bringing the convention experience directly to you. And while this may be GalaxyCon's G.I. Joe weekend, today we are joined by five fantastic actors whose characters held allegiance to Cobra, that terrorist, ruthless organization determined to rule the world. So without further ado, let us meet these enemies of human freedom. Our first guest is an actor and instructor whose body of work includes the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Tailspin, and of course, the voice of the title character, Bravestar. Today he joins us as the voice of the most feared combat pilot in Cobra, known only by his call sign, Wild Weasel. Please welcome the fabulous, stupendous, absolutely amazing, who did not ask me at all to prompt his introduction with superlative adjectives, Pat Fraley. Is this on straight? Oh, oh, I'm on. Hi. Hey. <laughs> I didn't smile. I should be mean. Oh, no, no. You're, you're good. Again, because you also were the voice of Hazardous Operations Specialist, codenamed Airtight, and G.I. Joe's top combat ace, code, yeah, ace, codenamed Ace. He was an ace named Ace. Very funny. And that was always I thought was the interesting dichotomy. You did the voices of both of the best pilots of G.I. Joe and Cobra. Yeah, I had fights with myself. Yeah. <laughs> that must have been some interesting sessions. Uh, how you doing up there, sir, wherever you're at? I'm in Los Angeles. I'm doing fine. It's an interesting era for us to go through. A great opportunity to show kids how we deal with adversity. <laughs> well, that that this this year has been a, a learning experience for all of us <laughs> in more ways than one. And as like I said before, if we're all doing okay, then okay is the new awesome. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Pleasure to have you here. It's been wonderful. absolutely glad to have you at the Galaxy Con virtual stage. And who else is here? He is an actor whose credits include The Garfield Show, Kingdom Hearts, and Transformers as several voices, including Grimlock, the leader of the Dinobots. Today, he joins us as the voice of Cobra's chief saboteur, known only as Firefly. Please welcome Greg Berger. Hey, hey. Hey, how you doing? I know it's a uh, GI Joe pal, but uh, yeah, this hey, you guy. know what? It's 2020, and Firefly would like to blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> and as well, uh, you also gave uh, voice to Coast Guard Operations Specialist Cutter, Communication Specialist Sparks, Reconnaissance Specialist Spirit, and October Guard Leader Colonel Breakoff himself. I uh, I went where they sent me. I only go where I'm invited, but thankfully. Along with the other guests at the G.I. Joe party, uh, we've been invited to some wonderful opportunities. And Absolutely. friends for a lifetime, colleagues for a lifetime. Uh, you know, it starts with a job, and if you're lucky, it uh, leads to a career. <laughs> Amen to that. Welcome to the show, sir. So glad to have you here. Thanks, man. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Cool. Our next guest is an actor whose credits include the Snorks, Zorro, and DuckTales. Today, he joins us as the voice of the former orthodontist turned Cobra's chief interrogator and science officer, Dr. Mindbender. Please welcome Brian Cummings. I want you to hate me, but love me too. <laughs> hey, hello. Hey, how you doing, boss? I'm doing fine from the voice cave here. I'm, I've actually left Los Angeles. I was run out by people I owed money to, and I'm here at the base of the Rocky Mountains. In the my actual base is my actual basement, uh, just next to the Rocky Mountains here, just south of Denver, Colorado. Woo! Okay. <laughs> awesome. I do I deliver papers on the weekend. Okay, but anyway. oh, that's good. That's good. But uh, well, you you've also you had besides the, the cartoons, you had a tremendous career in and in, in announcing. I know, sorry, is that weird stuff? We were going over stuff. I had I had an an interview show with. Uh, Rock and roll and pop stars uh, on an airline. Okay, I had like Gene Roddenberry and and the wonderful Stan Lee and uh, and George Carlin, all sorts of wonderful people. Uh, I did. I, I was a disc jockey. Ended up in Los Angeles at Kiss Radio. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I got around. I did a game show. Uh, I was the uh, I was the co-host on Let's Make a Deal or Let's Make Him Squeal, as we called it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I was around. I was one of those guys. I didn't do anything really well, but I did a lot of stuff. So yeah. Hey, it's it's all paycheck at the end of the day, right? And my cheap cameraman is like, quiet, stop, quit moving. <laughs> okay, I'm fine. <laughs> Our next guest is an actor with an incredible body of work that includes Star Wars, Rebels, Crank, and of course, Deadwood. Today, he joins us as the voice of Cover Commander's personal ninja bodyguard, Storm Shadow. Please welcome Keone Young. 
Hey. Hey. Hang day. <laughs> Hang day. <laughs> How are you doing, Keone? I'm doing well. Doing well. Uh, everything is okay in your corner of the world? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, you know, as voice actors, we've had to uh, uh, build our own sound studios in our homes. So that's been a trajectory that's uh, been very interesting. And uh, we'll see what goes from here. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, the year is almost over, and uh, I'm looking forward to 2021 being a reboot of our current times. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And finally, uh, she is an actress and writer whose credits include Spider-Man as the voice of the very first version of Felicia Hardy, the Black Cat, Ben 10, and of course, Star Blazers, a series dear to my heart. Today, she joins us as the voice of Cobra's Director of Intelligence, known by her hereditary title, The Baroness. Please welcome the always lovely Morgan Lofting. <laughs> Do you like this? I figured this was completely appropriate for now it's so nice to be here i am i am i am blown away by the technology i started zooming in the spring mm -hmm. i was zooming yoga and i think i was zooming a class from ucla with everybody on the screen and then everything would go blank or the sound would go out it was and look here we i'm just like i mean i have no idea how it works steam yard huh okay but it's it's really cool. <laughs> and it is cool. Hello, everybody. How are you? Oh, we are lovely, Morgan. It's so lovely to see you again. And it's great to have you all here. Thank you all for joining us here today. As always, we look forward to the day when the world does get a little bit back to normal and we can resume our physical shows and we can get you back on our stages and get you back in front of your fans. In the meantime, we are thrilled to have you all here on the GalaxCon virtual stage. It's incredible. In the meantime, yeah. I don't have to drive in Los Angeles, so there's an upside to all this. As far as I'm concerned, let me add it. Let me add it's especially nice to have Pat here because you know. <laughs> Just I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, right, yeah, I gotta, yeah, I, I gotta, I gotta make that twenty bucks he gave me worthwhile. So, <laughs> our team right now is in the chat room and going through and pulling out the questions. In the meantime, I would just love for everyone's uh, edification to know how did you come into these roles for GI Joe? And if we went in chronological order, I think we start with you, Morgan. Uh, you were there from the very beginning in the original five oh, series. God, yes, uh, Wally Burth, old studio on Ventura Boulevard. Uh, Don Jerwich was casting and directing, um, got the call. Well, I was on the Spider-Man, as you mentioned, the Spider-Man show before that as Aunt May and the Black Cat, which I thought was a great range. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> True, no. <laughs> they, they gave me a picture of what she looked like, a black and white picture, and they must have given me a little bio because I, honest to God, don't know where the accent came from. There must have been something about we want Middle European or something. And then they gave you a little bit of a script. And I went outside. Everybody basically went outside because you don't want the other actors to know what you're planning, you know. Plus, I wanted to holler. And I'm, I'm really sure that the only reason I got the part other than the positively fabulous accent, which is from God knows where, um, is that I, I stood in the studio and I just screamed Cobra as loud as a human body could. <laughs> and what what it, uh, Mike Bell used to say, there was blood on the control room window. You know? oh, <laughs> so we can all yell Cobra and blow out the sound in our computers if you want to. But... It is, it is a little a little more guttural to say Cobra than Yo Joe, so oh, I, 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 I give you all yeah, <laughs> I give you all props for it. having to do yeah, especially the Cobra yeah you had to linger mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. so absolutely and then uh, the second miniseries Revenge of Cobra Greg I believe that's when uh, your character emerged uh, and as far as origin by the time I got there Wally was doing the casting along with all of the other powers that be. Uh, you see people flailing on the other side of the glass and you think they hate you and you find out they're just deciding what to have for lunch. But uh, <laughs> Wally, by the time I got there, used to have a table full of scripts. And to his credit, and it really is to his credit, 
he would say on a little handwritten card, pick three that you think best suit you. So he gave that uh, screening process to the actor themselves. So we would pick, we'd go in, but you were already uh, sort of self-screened. Uh, he'd encouraged you to do what you thought showed you best. Well, those of us who are uh, multi-voice actors, uh, we we crave what what turns us on. What what gets everything, all the juices flowing is is when you get versatility and the opportunity to yeah. demonstrate it. Anyway, thankfully um, that was heard and appreciated and uh, employed, and uh, thereby hangs a tale, you know. And I was doing Transformers at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, honestly, it was sort of a golden age of animation where you had to have an agent just to have someone who knew where you were supposed to be next. It was like being in, in radio in the golden days where people would go live show to live show uh, running in front of taxis to get to the next studio. A lot of us had schedules that were not unlike that. And then over the course of a lifetime, you learn it's not necessarily always like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, 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 we had some uh, Transformers boys here last week, and yeah, I absolutely agree with that. That was a remarkable time because Saturday morning programming was still going strong, but there was the wonderful independent market and the syndication packages that were going on as well. So exactly. yeah, that, that was it, it. Was it was a boom time, and um, <laughs> yeah, it'd, it'd be nice to see another emergence like that. But uh, we'll we'll get there. So, and then we come to Pyramids of Darkness, the third mini series, and that. That's when Keone, you came on board. Yes. You know, I come from a different route than most people did. I was not a voice actor. You have to understand that during the 60s and 70s, which was when I started, there was a really social upheaval at the time. There was, you know, civil rights movement. And uh, I was basically in performance arts, but I was more of an activist. And uh, Wally, -E, because this it was transforming the whole entertainment industry, asking for more diversity, but diversity based on reality, Wally -E had the kind of like foresight to see that. And so he wanted to make his crew a diverse, uh, his cast, you know, a diverse cast, and uh, mm -hmm. which he did. And so when the create, when the character of Storm Shadow was created, and he was created by a wonderful guy, which I met in 76. His name is Larry Hama. Mm -hmm. oh. And they, they called Larry because, well, they wanted, if they're going to do something Asian, they had to have to have it based on history and reality. And so with that, Wally called me. Actually, he came down to East West Players, which was an Asian American theater company that I was involved in developing. And uh, he said, you know, I want authenticity. And that's what we were doing. We were studying our history. We were recreating characters based on our history. Um, and so Storm Shadow was not far away from the kind of character that I wanted to develop and that we were developing. So mm -hmm. I was new to the voice and I, I was surrounded by all these, these wonderful talents, but the thing about voice acting that, and I just want to say this now, uh, that I found out because eventually I started working with guys like Frank Walker, uh, Don Messick, and Bill Scott. And I found out, wow, voice actors are really not only great artists, but they were great human beings as well. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to work with great human beings. And Don and Frank kind of took me under their wing and kind of said like, hey, you know, I, let me help you out here and there. And uh, so that's how I started. So when I'm with these guys like Pat and Morgan and, 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 and Greg, I feel uh, diminished in a way, uh, you know, because I, I, they were, they paved the way for voice acting, which I did not really fully grasp at that time. And at 73, which I am today, I'm still learning. So, uh, and constantly le learning and approaching it that way. But uh, as far as Storm Shadow no goes, uh, 
I think that I have a depth of understanding of the history and character. Yeah. As well as Larry Hama. And uh, we work together, Larry and I do, in terms of understanding the character of Storm Shadow. Because I don't, I, you know, Storm Shadow has a, this really complex history. Very. From, you know, very from going with uh, Quick Kick and uh, being, hum, I don't know how many times he's become a Joe to a Cobra to a Cobra to the Joe. Yeah. Which kind of like reflected <laughs> off the history of humanity. Because we keep going back and forth anyway. You know, I'm talking about politics now. But anyway, <laughs> sorry, no, I, no. Took up, I took up all no, this no. intellectual and academic. No, not yeah. at all. This, 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 this is what this is what can we try. Hear me? No, he can't hear me. Yeah, well, I can hear you. Oh, did you know that Larry Hama was in Pacific Overtures on Broadway? Of course, that's where okay. I met him. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. Actually, actually, I was offered a role in uh, in Pacific Overtures. Uh, I had to even sing for Stephen Sondheim, and I was offered a role, but I turned it down because I I I felt that I didn't want to become a a, a Broadway actor. I wanted to come back mm -hmm. to L.A. and develop myself as a character actor. Uh, and then what they were offering me was like musical chorus boys kind of stuff. I was very young and yeah. to do like five, six different parts, you know, coming in, bringing in the tray, you know, and I said, no, 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 no. I want to, I want to. Okay. Never mind. I know. No, no but I, I, oh. I, I know yeah. Larry very well. Yeah. You make he was that. an actor at that time in Pacific Overtures. Yes. I think he was amazed that he was cast in it. That's what he said to me. And yeah. Larry also drew. Oh, the Baroness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Larry, Larry, Larry Hama, and for our audience mm -hmm. doesn't know, was the was the handed the assignment by Jim Shooter. Here, do something with this toy license and to build the foundation of these characters. Larry Hama was a former serviceman, United States Army, and and an actor, and a comic illustrator, and an editor, and a writer. He is a Renaissance man. I've had the privilege of hosting him several times, and he's funny yeah. as hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like. It's like exactly funny. So, and then going on to Storm Shadow's character, my only regret of the animated series was that they did not translate as much of Storm Shadow's mythology from the comics oh. and the rivalry with Snake Eyes and everything else. I can understand visually why they took it with Quick Kick and everything else, but that was to this day is my my only yeah. regret I ever have about the series. So, but uh, also though, we had the debut in that season of the fabulous, truly magnificent. Pat made his debut in Pyramids of Darkness. Please tell us, sir, how did you come about this role? Nepotism. <laughs> All right. I met Don Church, who produced the show, in Tahiti a couple of years before. I was doing everything I'd learned and everything. He said, look, if you'll shut up, I'll listen to your grandma. <laughs> So within months, I was in L.A. He was embarrassed that I got married and moved there, so he would hire me on little jobs. And that's how I got in G.I. Joe playing, I suppose, Ace. And then it was a matter of – so Ace was a little sarcastic, my voice, okay? It's a little bit that way. Got Wild Weasel. He was mean, so I did a mean voice. And then the other guy had an instrument over him, so I did, all I had to do was butch it up. <laughs> no, just a, very briefly, the mid 80s was an interesting time. By the way, when I came to town, Brian Cummings owned Los Angeles. He <laughs> and yeah. helped me. I'll, you be quiet. I'm talking about you. <laughs> he owned and really helped me a great deal get situated. And it's not true that he did many things okay, he did everything wonderfully. But the mid 80s, there were only 20 of us who would do three characters in a 22 and a half minute show. Keani was an actor. The rest of us were sort of doing on, off, voice, whatever. I was so blessed to be with them. And we thought we were really good. They loved G.I. Joe, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all these shows. No, we were selling toys. And by the way, not selling, there was no money. It was time. 
Mm-hmm. When I started, it was 13 episodes for a season. Then they did reruns. Then He-Man killed them Monday through Friday with the numbers, and we went to 65 episodes. But to this day, even Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is produced by a toy company. Mm-hmm. We were selling toys, and very briefly, not but for money, we went to the 11s, or the salesmen went to the 11 and 13s of the world. So those were the independent you know, non-network sh- uh, channel. They mm-hmm. said, how would you like to have G.I. Joe for nothing? And they went, yeah. Oh. Okay, well, we'll trade you time. Oh. Then the salesman with the time would take that to an ad agency and sell it. Yeah. And that's oh, how man. we got this yeah. golden age of animation. And it was golden, Greg. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. God. It was. But none of us realized what, I certainly didn't realize what it was until the 90s when I was doing some show, talking to an AD, and I said, oh, and I did G.I. Joe. And there was this gap, soundless gap. And I turned around and he's like, wait, what? Yeah. (laughs) Then all of a sudden it was more than just having fun and getting a paycheck. It was something that was kind of lasting. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And when the when they did hit a full series, Brian, that's when you came on board as Dr. Mindbender, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the nepotism thing works for me too. Oddly mm-hmm. enough, that studio on Ventura Boulevard, I built with a, a drummer buddy of mine in partnership, and we sold it to Wally Burr. And I think Wally first hired me f- for a Pink Panther special out of guilt because of how badly he took me to the cleaners buying the studio. <laughs> and on, on that special, it was the first special where the Panther was going to speak. And it was Frank Welker and yours truly waiting for Hal Smith to get to there from another job. And Wally said, I don't want to edit for the next three years of my life. So he said, when Hal gets here, we'll give him whatever's left. So you guys, he just recast the show as we went along and we ended up doing all the voices. And so that's when Wally thought, Maybe I can use him on the G.I. Joe thing. And I walked in and just out of the sky, looked at this guy and it's like, OK, this guy's a villain. He's kind of like uh, like Jekyll and Hyde meets Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's yeah. what and that was the gig. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Brian, Brian, yeah. do you remember that wall that we all all signed in that yeah. studio? Yeah. That wall must be worth a lot of money if it, it still <laughs> existed. Sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, every, every. Somebody uh, probably uh, painted over it. <laughs> same, same thing. If you ever went to Bell Sound, they took down the Gobos, but everybody that was famous in the world, from the musicians, from Hal Blaine to, to legendary actors, all signed the wall. The thing that kills me about my career is that my wife cleaned the garage and we had tapes of all those old billboard shows that we did. And I don't have the Roddenberry and I don't have oh. the George Carlin and I don't have the Stan Lee because there was like, oh, that crap in the garage. So it was all thrown out. I had copies of everything. Wow. Oh, oh. You know, dang it. But it was a magical time. It truly, you're right. It was an absolutely magical yeah. time. You never knew what you were going to do. You showed up and, and it was like a party. And Joe was especially great for us because, and it's because Wally was such a perfectionist. We spent infinitely more time doing our shows than anything else we did. And that meant we all hung out in the outer room and we got yeah. to know each other and t- tell stories and get interesting things about people's lives uh, that were really fabulous. That I, I still like like laugh at some of the stories today. One, one of the guys, I would never mention Hank by name, Hank, Hank Garrett. I don't want to actually embarrass him, but <laughs> doing a stand-up gig at a nightclub that was owned by some questionable people. And at the end of the week, the guy said, uh, he's paying the band, he's paying the girl singer. And he says, says to Hank, he says, uh, I, I don't have a lot of cash left. Let me write you a check. And the guy's going, I know this guy's connected. So I said, I'll go back to the hotel and come back and you could write me the check. And the club owner says, no, no, take, I said, or get cash. And he said, no, 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 take the check. And this goes on three times. And the guy utters a few words we can't say. And it's take the blankety blank check. So he takes the check. And the gag was, as he's sitting on the couch telling me the story was, the check was good, but the cash, remember the guy was connected? Yeah. If it's got Jim Carrey's face on it, it may not be real, that principle. Do I? Okay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What has uh, what's been uh, one of your favorite memories, uh, all of you, from being associated with GI Joe? Oh, everything I went through to have eight kids. No, no, sorry, forget that. That's oh. actually, okay. Eight. <laughs> Pat, Pat understands having many children. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump on to what Brian was just previously talking about. <laughs> My happiest memory 
as as much as we were being paid to play and as much as we all kept each other's spirits up behind the mic and kept tension as low as it could get although uh, you know we were creating we were creating a, a combat situation so there's tension that's inherent yeah. but my happiest and favorite memories are the downtime when they were all <laughs> rapidly rewriting stuff in the booth which gave us in those days hours of time uh to sort of hang out and bad coffee and good schmooze and great oh, gossip yeah. and yeah. dirty jokes yeah. mm-hmm. and that's that's my happy memory uh, not to not to under uh uh estimate the the uh the artistry of everybody involved but it was the peopleness of the situation yeah. that lasts me a lifetime gratefully yeah still we, we still i think we still miss but, each other we do yeah yeah. Oh God! I've, I've got. You don't I've like got something that so came out of that that mm-hmm. experience. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, Janelle, can we blow that up, please? Because <laughs> it's hard to uh, actors that came out. Of that I mean, you had young guys. That's great. Okay, yeah. I'll stop. <laughs> uh, Greg and Chris Latta and I ran around to create an ad for the Hollywood Reporter that was having a very special animation section. And this is our ad. Wow. Oh my God. You remember how, yes, I still have. Yes, thank you. Yes. There we go. Spirit and and Chris is, oh my God, who is Chris there? I don't know, Ripper? Yeah. (laughs) Spirit. Spirit Spirit and gung-ho. Yeah. Well, funny that was. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just absolutely love this. We just had, we had no idea what we were doing, but we were doing it. Damn it! And we were going to have an ad in Hollywood Reporter. Wow. I've got a memory that was great of GI Joe. It was called GI Joe Golf. <laughs> See, Wally Burr was fired from Hanna Barbera for going along. When we work with them, it, it, we'd have 12 hour sessions. Unbelievable. Oh. Mm. So, Neil Ross, who was in the show, played Shipwreck, I believe, and other yep. characters. We got in doing G.I. Joe golf, and that was we'd look at him at May, a line, and go, okay, this is a par four. <laughs> sure enough, he'd go up and do five takes of the one line. Well, you have double eagles or bulky, a bulky. <laughs> you know, and that's what uh, we enjoy playing golf. <laughs> nice. Kiyote, uh, what's been your favorite uh, G.I. Joe memory? Well, you, you, you have to know the, the actors that were involved, each one had a unique history. And uh, I mean, working with young guys like Rob Paulson at the time and Corey Burton and Kenny Holiday. I mean, it, it was just a bunch of great and B.J. Ward. Dick yeah. Godier, uh, it was just a bunch of talented people. And that, like Greg was saying, it, it would just be great sitting around in the green room talking with these people and getting to know them. And uh, th- there was one, ge- th- there was a couple generations there, the older generation, and then there were young guys. And uh, mm-hmm. it's just, I, it was just the, the yeah. history of voice acting right there yeah in a way you know? and, and you you actually you raise a, a very good point because yeah that was that was a snapshot of of two generations uh going on at the same time there's like a lot Char- of you know, charlie adler was there yeah yeah charlie. yeah yeah. What's, great, what's great when we actually had real people coming up to us. It's amazing to have of all the projects that we've ever done. We've all had things we thought this is going to be legendary. This show is going to be remembered forever. And I have several <laughs> of those things people go, huh? What? I have never heard of that one. And so, the Joes, there are now four generations of people that show up who are Joe fans still oh, wow. to this day. It's amazing. Wow. People bring their, their little kids. Yeah. And- so gratifying. Yeah. But you but- remember it. Yeah. But you don't get to predict the future. All yeah. you can do is try to exceed expectation in the moment. And and yes. fate determines what's remembered and what's not. The goal mm-hmm. is to be memorable. Uh, yeah. But that that predicting what's going to go, what's going to be big, what's you find out as you go. You can't find out until you go. 
I, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I always try to head people off in the past uh, when the, the common question, did you always know it was going to be a success when you were doing it? I always, I always flip that question. How about this? When did you discover it was going to be a success? <laughs> and I think, and I know for some of the cases, but we are good to go on audience questions. So I will ask Janelle to roll our first one. And this will come from Ryan, who wants to know, what's it like being a part of something with the longevity of G.I. Joe? which actually dovetails into my last thing. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to go first? I, I don't want to be a blabbermouth, but uh, it's a source of great pride. The fact that something becomes remembered, becomes embraced, that through this worldwide convention reality yeah. phenomenon, that we have the chance to meet fandom one on one, find out impact it's had on people's lives, which we could never have dreamt of. Yeah. Um, it, it's a source of extreme pride for me. I, I, I keep being blown away when people say to me, you're the voice of my childhood. Yes. That kind of took me back there for a minute. You know, how much younger am I? Uh, never mind. Um, but but yeah, right, Dr. Minderbender. Yes. <laughs> it is. It's like, wow. And then and then they really do bring their children who may or may not really care. Their kids have their own mm -hmm. thing going on. But, but I'm it's I'm, just there are, people, there are people out there. It's like you're the voice of my second childhood. I mean, that it's still oh. going on. There's that the the connection on the other side of here on the other side of the computer. There on the other side of the glass. Mm -hmm. The other side of whatever is you've connected with someone who felt a connection with you before you knew there was a connection with them, and that's really kind of magical in its own way. Oh, it is. It, I, I really began to understand that a lot of these latchkey kids, boy, and. We we were and forgive me for that. We were the. Uh, we, Steven we were the the thing that kept them going. We were the avatar of of the period. Very much so. Uh, I've met people who've gone on to distinguished military service and attribute their initial passion to the show. Isn't that that's something? incredible? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. I had, okay, Neary was with me up in Santa Rosa at a show. And a guy showed up who said, I came just to see you. It was a little show. He had grown up in Iran, hmm. where obviously the show was subtitled. And he was now at Caltech sending large projects up into the air. I mean, the the people that we're inspired by this thing. Just kind of... Keone, uh, how about you? Well, you know, yes and no. I mean, sometimes you get a slap in your face and you think, yeah, I was in G.I. Joe. And your son comes along and goes, ah, that's analog. <laughs> 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 We're in a digital age now. You yeah. know, so, so I mean... You can't get too much of yourself at the same time, but uh, you have to know that what lasts uh, has depth. And, and so uh, it's something that we have to investigate within ourselves. Why? I mean, I remember the days back in the days Greg was talking, there was no VHS. There was no recording device. If you wanted to see G.I. Joe, you had to run home from school and catch it. And if you missed it, that was it. And you had to ask your friends the next day at school, well, what happened to Storm Shadow? You know? Yeah. And so uh, then yeah. and there, I kind of realized, oh, yeah, yeah, this is going to have some validity to it. Yeah. Uh, I was one of those kids that would come home and I would catch the last five <laughs> minutes of the miniseries and I was losing my mind. And, and then, then the old man, then the old man did buy a VCR around that time. They were starting to come out, but yeah, those first two, that, that second season I was, I was, I was denied. So yes, I absolutely one of those. And Pat, how about you? I think it's um, kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> my boys are all in their thirties and I mean, maybe 15 years ago, one of them called me a voiceover has been. <laughs> um, they didn't know what I did for a living. They thought I did sounds, and I, I've done 
hundreds of cartoons. And um, it's a little strange because um, the um, there is a rumor that if you get older, it doesn't matter because you're doing voiceover. Not so. You get a little older, and who wants to work with an old person? It's creepy. <laughs> so when you live this life that goes for decades, it's a little strange. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm it, right there with you. So the computer is great in one way that a lot of times your clients don't see you, so they don't know until they see you. Then it may change. But at least you have a, a little grace period. I can't do this on camera. I can't do like I can't you know, what Skype or anything. So we'll just do the. And then they later they discover that you're old, and then they shine, shine you. But you get it like a grace period, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> then you remind them of their father or their grandmother yeah. or. Well, see, there's the, the other thing with the eight kids phenomenon was. When you did your stick at home, your kids said, Dad, cut it out. Let's knock off the crap. And, and then their friends would come over and say, Dad, Dad, can you do your voice from whatever? You know, it's like, oh, show off for my friends so I look cool <laughs> in the eyes of my friends. Yeah. Yeah, free, and you got like another reprise. So it kind of works that many ways. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, yeah, have, right. You been, have you seen somebody on, on you said, man, does he look old? Man, does she look old? And then you look at the mirror and go, oh. Okay, and you walk on. Yeah. You all look great and you sound even better. And Ryan, thank you. There's a great question to start us off with. What do we have next? From Daniel, what do you all think was the weirdest scheme Cobra planned? Hmm. I'm, I'm going to be quiet because I, I already know what I'm, but I know. I'll just say weather dominator and leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> Or the, or the DNA, the uh, mixing of the DNA cocktail to come up with a supervillain. Yes. It kind of works, yeah. <laughs> ah, we'll make Serpentor! <laughs> Should we? Yeah, this, I command. Didn't think of the wardrobe at the time, though, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, your character's not want to talk about wardrobe. <laughs> no, no, no. Or, or budget by the time they had to dress you, I think. I there was a guy in Lodi, I said, if you shaved your head and you worked out and you'd show up in a leotard, I'd have you at every con. I said, and I'd go home and the door would be locked and they wouldn't let me in. But yeah. <laughs> Do it once. Do it once. Do what? What? You just, 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 all Do right. It. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll popcorn this. Anybody else uh, remember uh, a cockeyed plot that just made you go, what? <laughs> Listen. Oh, we'll, we'll stick with Weather Dominator and a biological clone of the despots of history to conquer the world. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> we were working with Arthur Berghardt, Chris Latta, and Chuck McCann. And what could be weirder than those guys? <laughs> I mean, the story was nothing compared to what we were dealing with. You know, I mean, they were just far out. I mean, great artists in in their ways, and but they to, were special. I want so, to make a friend for life, bring a lozenge to uh, to Dick Gautier. Just <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I I right, I I caught one of Chris's uh, stand up uh, bits, and I just loved his line where he described himself as, "I am." I am not a comedian. I am a sociopath that has found a way to monetize his disability. Absolutely. So, Daniel, thank you. Fun question. What do we have next? From Yer, uh, or Yer, perhaps. So that's about, sorry for the mm -hmm. pronunciation. Do you have a favorite line from your character from the show? Yar. I like Yar. <laughs> that's my Yar. favorite so far. <laughs> Short and sweet. Yeah, okay. Well, I know that, that fans come up to me, and some of the fans like this one. This throw, I hear bells. <laughs> <laughs> I got a favorite, but it's not mine. I was in a show, and I don't know, it was one of those extended ones, and I heard, this is the first time I'd seen the script. We didn't get scripts in advance in those days, remember, guys? We go, we go there, get notes, and do them. And uh, B.J. Ward was in there, and there were two lines. One was, how did Ace do? And then the person responded, the other character, he didn't come back. And I went, wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. 
wait a minute. Do I have my rent for this month? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like the, the play, The Killing of Sister George. <laughs> it's all about a character dying in a soap opera. Well, this actually happened to me, which is wow. uh, another long, long but funny story about Neil Ross and I getting cast for a dead character's voice, Ace, and both getting cast, and then the producer calling and saying, one of you can't do the show because you sound the same. But that, that's later. <laughs> okay. Fair. Yeah, usually at least you get the script. They say, oh, I paid for whatever. But you had to hear it from the next room. That's rough. <laughs> that's really <laughs> rough. Really rough. <laughs> hey, as far as favorite line, I got to jump to the Joe side, but I love – that spirit said, possibility and impossibility are states of mind. In my <laughs> mind, there is only the possible, that which can be done. Oh, that's good. Oh, oh my God. God. Um, it's pretty, really, it's pretty really, that's pretty um, that slick. So, uh, Kiyote, remember, remember, remember a line? No, you know, I make up stuff. I steal stuff from Bruce Lee. And, uh, you know, so never take your eye off your opponent. There you go. There you go. Which, which, Storm Shadow never said. It was in Bruce Lee who said it in the Year of the Dragon. Wow. But <laughs> I thought uh, Harry Sampler once said. Storm that. Shadow never spoke that much. He used words yeah. very sparingly. Very true. Very very true. And Brian, bring us home on this one. I don't know what to say. Everything Mindbender said was crazy, so I'm not sure. But he's like, you know. Uh, so I'm not sure I would be I would I would remember another bad line. We have ways of making you talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, so let's make it a good one. And this comes from SR. When did you <laughs> when did you realize that G.I. Joe was a hit? <clears throat> I never saw any. I was busy making show. Yeah. 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 Now you 200 Ninja Turtles. How many? I've seen six. I guess when I get really old, I can sit in a room for days, if not a month, and watch myself do characters and do voices. But I, I think I've probably only seen one or two shows. I never knew. I think I think it was a hit. Even Ninja Turtles, I went, really? Okay. I, I think yeah. I realized I realized it was a massive hit when somebody asked me, "When did you realize that GI Joe was a massive hit?" I, I thought <laughs> that moment. Oh, Fair. Uh, Jumping well, on that um, earlier about the the AD on the show in the nineties, um, but I didn't realize it was a massive hit. What I realized that it had affected some people very strongly, but that's not exactly the same thing. You can't bank that, but it was very touching, very surprising, very kind of, I, I didn't know quite how to process it. It's like when people would come up and, and say how important some of our characters had been when they were growing up, and you're like, really? I, I mean... Yeah me a while to get it that it really was kind of an yeah an important thing so, I, so since it was a real massive hit with those people that were at home yeah. uh, I, I remember the first time i sat with you morgan and i i, I praise you for nvidia and star blazers and you had just a uh, snap it's like you're old enough to have seen that I'm like yeah <laughs> okay let me say one thing i think we voice actors, in particular like G.I. Joe, were owned by the people who watch the, the, us in shows like a puppet. And people come up and hug me. <gasps> now, I wouldn't go up to Brad Pitt and hug him. But they <laughs> kind of own us. And mm -hmm. it's so delightful. Yeah. Well, jumping on what Pat said earlier, I think as artists, we commit to the process you can't commit to the results. The results yeah. happen when the results happen. Mm. You're too busy, uh, just immersed in the process. But yeah. when you have a show where you get called back and called back and your character is developing and arcs are happening and you're actually <clears throat> beginning to live this guy in three dimensions, <laughs> then the business side is you get this great congratulatory notice that the show's been picked up for another season. That's when I knew, knew that yeah. something was being, you know, 
we, yeah. we we were we were a hit. That's why. Because your uh, uh, your cousins at the, the Transformers cast, which you know, uh, Greg, you're a part of, same thing. They, yeah, they they said too that oh they they got fan mail, but they never they never showed it to us. Right. You know, That's they got you know, yeah. You know, Peter said, oh, I found out later that people were writing fan mail similarly to me. Never showed it to any of us. They yeah. and I don't know if it was intentional to keep you all in the dark, or Maybe. they were just just a, an afterthought that they just didn't think. Oh, by the way, guys, you're doing a good job. Quickly back to the happy memories uh, on Transformers. If Scatman brought his ukulele, they could stay in those writers' meetings as long as they wanted. We just wanted it to go on and on and on in the parking lot. I I I I, I still miss him tremendously. He was such such an incredible talent. Yeah, just, absolutely. I'm not sure that the producers realized how much we embodied. And how much that soundtrack, the voice track, the sounds, the crazy blow them up, and the music track were to make that show pop. For sure, for sure. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And and yeah. I and and again, uh, the the since since GI Joe and Transformers are so entwined, they learned the hard way the folly of get, pushing old characters out to make way for new ones when they try to get, try to kill off Optimus Prime. Discovered what a disaster that was. Hastily rewriting GI Joe the movie so that Duke and, and Michael Bell is only in a coma and he's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. He's just yeah. resting. Yeah. Yeah. Just resting. I I I, I didn't get to. I always say Peter Cullen. It's like, I hope Michael Bell buys you a drink every time you guys appear <laughs> together. <laughs> so you take a one for the team. So, ah. Uh, Gentlemen and lady, it has been my absolute pleasure to serve you today. And GalaxyCon viewers, this has been my time with the cast of Cobra. Panelists, any final words for our audience before we go? Do we just sit here and look good or what? Yeah. Or we just sit here. <laughs> yeah, okay. 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 Thank you, Patty. Uh, thank you very much. Ed, shall we shall we send off with a with a Cobra? Okay. Yeah. One, two, three. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> Galaxy Con viewers, my pleasure to serve you once again. Thank you for joining us at the Galaxy Con virtual stage. Thank you to our audience for joining us, and thank you for your great questions. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Take care, and please keep washing those hands. <laughs>